We were created to do just that, to speak the name of Jesus. Over everything in our lives and things in other people's lives, our kids, our world, our pain, our joy, it's all about Jesus. I'm going to be in John chapter 3. John chapter 3. I'm going to start reading in verse 14 and read on down through verse 21. Very familiar scripture. But one that I can't get enough of. John 3, 14. If you would stand while I read from the word of God. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Oh God, we come to you this morning, Lord, and we just praise your name. We honor you and glorify you. And I thank you, Lord, for your love that you have shown in my life and in my family and in this church. I know that... Your love has been made manifest in so many lives around me, Lord. I praise you and honor you for it, Lord. I will always look to you, Lord, for that love and for your wisdom and for your understanding. Speak through me here today the words that you'd have me to say and open our hearts and our minds that we would get a little bit more of you here this morning. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. So a little context before we get started into the scripture. We, it, it's, you know, John 3.16, everybody knows it. Just about everybody who has been to church uh, can quote John 3.16. But sometimes we forget the context of where that came from. Why did Jesus say these words? And so in context, John chapter 3, we go back just a few verses and we see Jesus talking to a man named Nicodemus who was a Pharisee who came to Jesus by night, uh, um, I don't know, coming to Jesus and said, said, we know that you're a teacher come from God. We know that nobody could teach like you unless he's from God. We know that nobody can do the things you do unless you came from God. And more or less said, you know, you, you want to be one of us. And Jesus said, no, because here's the problem. I can't be one of you because I'm God. I can't be just a religious leader. I can't be just a teacher. I can't be just a prophet. I can't just be a man sent by God to teach you. I've got to be God. And that's who I am. That's what I always will be. And he goes on talking to Nicodemus about being born again. That you must be born again. You must be born both of flesh once, obviously, but then again, you're born into the Spirit of God. And you must be born of the Spirit. And, and he begins to say, oh, Nicodemus said, well, I don't understand. How can that possibly be? And he said, there's a lot of things in this life that you don't understand. You don't understand where the winds come from. You don't know, you, you don't know in your mind why the winds blow. And you can't see them, but they do damage. They, you know, they, they blew our shed down a few years ago, and I had to rebuild it. And then about three months later, it blew it down again, and I had to rebuild it again. Well, I didn't see the wind, but boy, I saw what it did. 
And Jesus told Nicodemus, said, you didn't see it, but you know it's there. Listen, he was saying that about the Spirit. We, we, you know, you, you can't really see it, but we know it's there, don't we? We know there's more than just this old flesh. And then Jesus said this. He says, now, how is it that you're a teacher and a master in Israel and you don't know these things? How is it that you're the one that God has in, in, instilled this, this great responsibility of teaching His people and you don't know about these things? And so that's a lesson to us, church, we have been given that great responsibility as the church. Just like the Jewish Pharisees, just like the leaders of the Jews were meant to go out and tell the world about God, now that's our job too as the church. That's our responsibility. And I think sometimes Jesus looks down on us and he says, how is it that I've given you so much? I've given you the Bible. I've given you the responsibility. I've given it all to you. How is it that you don't know more than you know? Because we don't put enough of ourselves into it. It's, it's not enough just to come to church on Sunday morning because we need to just bury our lives in the Word of God, in prayer, and in, in Jesus. And the more we do that, the more we'll know. And the more we know, the more we can tell. And the more we can make sense of a chaotic, crazy world to a people who needs some sense in their lives. Some people around us who need some stability in our lives. And the more of us we can, can just immerse in Jesus Christ, the more we can give that to the people around us. And they need it so desperately. And he said, you should be doing these things. You should know these things. And then Jesus goes on then to teach Nicodemus the gospel. And how does he start? He, he, he starts telling him things like, Things that Nicodemus would have known. Things about the Old Testament Scriptures. And he goes back and he says, Do you remember how in the Old Testament the children of Israel, and Nicodemus would have known this very well. And if you're not familiar with the, 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 the happenings in the Old Testament, God was feeding the children of Israel in the wilderness. Because of their unbelief, they were wandering in the wilderness. But God was feeding him with manna. But in time, as people will do, they began to say, oh, I am so sick of this manna. Y'all remember that? Oh, I am so sick of this manna that God has given me in the wilderness where there's nothing else to eat, mind you. I'm still sick of what God has given me. Listen, now there's a story in that for us, isn't it? that we should never get tired of what God does for us. Listen, we are, whether we know it or not, we are wandering in a wilderness where there's nothing else to eat, where there's nothing else to sustain us, where there's nothing else that can do for us what God can do for us. And sometimes we get like they are and we grumble against God. Oh, that we shouldn't do that. Because guess what happens to... Because God looked down and He said, okay, you don't like what I'm doing for you. I think we're going to have to get your attention. And so He sent snakes. And the snakes would bite them. And they cried out to God and said, save us from the snakes. And He said, He told Moses to put a snake up on a, on a pole. And if, and if you get bit, then you can go and you can look. But you know, there were some who were just stubborn enough to get bit by the snake and not look, wasn't it? Just some. Now, how many of us are just stubborn enough to get bit by the snake and not look for Jesus? How many people in this world are bit by the snake, the serpent of sin, and are just stubborn enough not to look to Jesus to live? We live in a world just like that, don't we? We live in a world that's just stubborn enough, even though there is life, that I'm not going to look for it. I'm going to go to the doctor. I'm going to go to the medicine man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chew on this root. I'm going to, I, I, yeah, I, I'm going to just hope I'm strong enough and tough enough. I'm just going to, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to do that, but I'm not going to look at Jesus. I'll do anything in the world but I'm too stubborn to look for Jesus. 
But he said, even as that scenario, even though the world is full of people who are snake bitten, sick and dying in their own sin, the Son of Man must be lifted up. Life for all to see if you just look for it. If you just will just swallow your pride, knowing that I'm snake bit, swallow my pride and look at Jesus lifted up on the cross. We can live. That is the gospel. And why did he provide that way for us? Why did he provide that way? He goes on to tell us, not only did, did I provide that way, but I did it because I love you. Because God loves you. How many of us believe that Jesus loves us? How many of you believe that Jesus loves you? And how much do you believe it? Because we can believe it a little and we can believe it as much and we can believe it this much and we can believe it enough that there ain't nothing else in the world can touch us because we believe it so much that we know that whatever He does for us is good for us. That whatever He has for us is good. And, the, and we don't want to live without His blessing. But we've got to lift Jesus up. In our Sunday school lesson this morning, it seems like every week, that Sunday school lesson is what we want to talk about. Lifting Jesus up. And only Jesus. And it asked the question, I saw in the Sunday school lesson, that it asked the question, what would you call a church that has gotten away from the foundational idea that Jesus is all there is. That we lift Jesus up and nothing else. And you know what the answer to that was in my mind? A cult. What else could it be? Because there's no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved. Only Jesus must be lifted up. And you say, oh, well, we would never do that. And I look around me and I remember, y'all remember when I was a teenager, boy, there was a thing going around where these churches, the, the teenagers didn't even go to church. And we, our churches were full of teenagers not going to church. Do y'all remember those days? What did they lift up in those days? Was Jesus lifted up? No, shooting basketball, eating pizza, having fun, going to the movies, going bowling. Let's go have a good time. Let's go to Six Flags and ride the, ride the rides. And, and the churches were full of people not going to church and not lifting Christ up. But were they getting saved? Listen to me. Were they getting saved? Was the church doing the right thing when they were getting full up of kids who wanted to go to Six Flags? I am here to tell you, no, they were not doing the right thing. Because if Jesus isn't the reason, if Jesus is not lifted up, then we're a cult. You say, oh, it's just kids. Oh, no. Because I know a lot of older people who go to church because they think it's their own personal country club. They go to church because they like the other folks that go there. You know that because if they get to not liking one of the other folks, they quit coming. Now, are you there because you like the folks? And I hope we do. But are you there because you like everybody there and there ain't nobody there that you don't like? Or are you there for Jesus? Now answer the question for yourselves. Am I going to turn around and walk out of a place and say, well, I got mad at that guy, and so I'm going to walk out on Jesus? Now that makes no sense, does it? If you're there for Jesus... Church is not a social club, y'all. That's not what it's about. I hope there's some social stuff here. I hope people like to be with other Christians. I hope we love each other. I hope we can get along. I hope that all these things, and I hope if we have a difference, that we love each other enough we can work it out. But that's not what it's about. You don't lift up the social aspects. You don't lift up the basketball. You don't lift up the food. I've heard people say, oh, uh, I like to, this is what I like. I like the eating. I like the fellowship. I like, well, well, good. I hope we all like it. But what we better like more than anything else is Jesus. We've got to lift him up. And listen, the Bible says this. He said about himself, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. Now, he didn't say if you'll lift up a, a pan of pizza, I'll draw all men to me. 
Because you know what you're drawing them to? You're drawing them to Pizza Hut. He didn't say that if, I, if you lift yourselves up and your social skills up, that I'll draw all men to me. He, he didn't say anything else except if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. And if we want to get people dedicated to church, not just somebody that comes to, for some other reason, but if we want to pe get people who are dedicated to Christ, then we've got to lift Christ up. And only Christ. And listen, it may be slower. It may be harder. It may not be as easy. But you win souls to Christ by lifting Christ up. And that's what it's really all about. Not just getting somebody to come to church. That's not enough. We've got to get people saved. Born into Christ. A new creation who comes to church for Jesus, about Jesus, to praise Jesus, to love Jesus, and to be with His people and learn about Jesus. And He did all this, listen, He was lifted up on that cross and put through it. I just, you know, we, we haven't been. We think about what heaven is going to be like, but we haven't been there. And we look forward to it and we, we imagine what it's going to be like and we, we read in the Scripture a little bit about what it's going to be like and we look forward to it. But you remember Jesus was there and He left it. I'll promise you, when we get there, we're not going to want to leave for any reason. We're not going to want to leave. Jesus left all that for us to come live this life on this earth and to die for us. And he says here that God so loved the world. That's why. Who does he love? The whole world. And we're going to begin a, a, a series tonight. A five step of the five steps of Calvinism. We're going to do a study tonight. Listen, God did not just love a few. My Bible doesn't teach me that. My Bible says that He loved the whole world. That He loves everybody. That every single last human being on the face of this planet, God loves. And He sent His Son to die for us. For God so loved the whole world that He gave His only begotten Son. Listen, Jesus is unique. It's His only Son. Now listen, he didn't send, he's not going to send a, a different one again. Now Jesus is going to come back, but if you don't accept Jesus, he's not going to send somebody else you like better. He's not going to get to thinking around up in heaven and say, you know, they, they didn't like Jesus, so I'm going to send them Bob. Because he's a little nicer and he's going to talk to him a little gentler and, and it's not going to be, you know, I, I'm going to figure out a, another way that people will like a little better and maybe more. You know, my Bible doesn't say anything like that. And yet people kind of act like they think that's going to happen. People go around talking about God as if, well, God would never send anybody to hell. Well, my scripture I just read said, no, he doesn't. It's not his will that any go to hell. But you're condemned already if you haven't believed in Jesus. Because He's the only begotten Son of God. The only one there is. There is no other. He's the only begotten Son of God. And it says, and whosoever, whosoever, again, He loved the whole world. He loves everybody. And whosoever. Is that just a few? No, whosoever is anybody. Anybody. You know what? I am so glad that it's whosoever. Because I have pretty bad luck around sometimes. And it would be just my luck that I'd be the not-so-ever. How about you? You feel that way a little bit? Well, if, if it was just pick and choose and it was just random and we, had to, we just had to roll the dice on it and hope, I guarantee you I wouldn't make it. Thank God that's not how it works. Thank God that's not how it works. He said, whosoever will. Whosoever believes, anybody 
who believes. Now, believes, I think we've, we've watered down this word believes the way it's used in the Bible because belief is a lot stronger the word than what we sometimes act like it is. You know, belief, faith, is a very powerful thing. It's about really, honestly, truly believing that God is God, that Jesus is the only way, that heaven is real and that hell is real. Not might be, not could be, not fire insurance, as some, I heard an old preacher say, some people just want fire insurance. I just... I think there's a lot of people that just want fire insurance. They just, just in case hell is real, I'm going to pretend I believe in Jesus. That won't work. You've got to truly believe that he is who he said he is, that he is the son of God, that he is the king and Lord of all. And as king and Lord of all, whatever he says goes. And however he chooses to do things is good enough for me. And if you do that, if you believe in Him, you won't perish, but have everlasting life. And you look back and you see, all the way back in Scripture, to the very beginning, when Adam and Eve were in the garden, and Jesus said, and, and God told them, said, if you, if you eat of that tree, you will surely die. If you don't do what I tell you, if you go against me, if you disobey me, if you choose darkness over light, then you will surely die. And all humanity did just like Adam and Eve. And they chose to go against God and are condemned, as the Bible says, already because of that. But if you don't want to die, if you don't want, and, and listen, we think that physical death is the worst thing, but it's not. Physical death isn't what we think it is. If you think physical death is the worst thing that can possibly happen to you, just wait till you die if you don't know Jesus. It's far worse to die a spiritual death. Everlasting separation from God in a burning hell is the worst thing that could ever happen to anybody. But if you don't want that, you can have everlasting life because Jesus has been lifted up and if you believe in Him, He didn't come into the world to condemn you. Now a lot of people, you hear this all the time from unbelievers, that they don't like a God who judges. They don't like a God that's going to judge me, that's going to, that's going to condemn me. How, what kind of loving God could strike the gavel and condemn me to hell? You see, you've got it backwards. Now look at what Jesus says here. He says you've got it exactly backwards because the truth is that you're condemned already. Now, I've heard preachers take verse 17 and say, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn, his, condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. And just preach on that first little sentence and never go on to check, uh, verse 18 and basically say that God won't condemn the world. That Jesus didn't come to condemn you. That you're not condemned. That good feeling, oh, you're going to be all right. Well, the Bible, if you go on one more verse, you see, He didn't come to condemn the world because the world was already condemned. You don't come to condemn something that's already condemned. You come to save something that's already condemned. So brothers and sisters, we were already condemned. It's not that God is going to come get us and judge us and condemn us. It's that we're already lost in our sins and Jesus wants to save us. We've got to get it in order. We've got to get it straightened out. Because he says then in 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. And why? Because, because he did a lot of bad stuff? No. Because he didn't know the right people. Because he didn't go to the right church. Did he say anything else? What does it say? It says they're condemned already because they did not believe in the one and only Son of God. The only thing that's going to keep you condemned in this world, the only reason that you're going to end up going to hell when you die is if you don't believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That's it. That's the reason. And that's on you, brothers and sisters. Because Jesus did all that it takes. He did all that He had to do to save us from that condemnation. 
because you have not believed on the one and only Son of God. Now this is the condemnation. It says this is the condemnation. Is the condemnation that we made God mad? Did it say that? Is the condemnation because God is mean? No. What is the condemnation? It says this is the condemnation. That light is come into the world and men love the darkness more than the light. That is the condemnation. The condemnation is that Jesus came to save us and most men and women out there hate Jesus, hate the light, and want to live in darkness. They love it more. What do you love? You notice this is all hinging on my heart and what I love. Do I love Jesus and the ways of God, the good things that He tells me, or do I love the world and myself and, this, and, and, and the sin and the evil things of the world? Do I want to hold on to my darkness in my life? Do I love the bad things that's going on in my heart or do I want to push them out and take Jesus into my life? Do I want to let Jesus shine light on me? You notice what it says. It says when people are doing wrong, they like to do it at night, don't they? Why do they like to do all the bad things at night? They think nobody can see them, right? Somewhere in their heart they know that what they're doing is wrong and they just don't want people to really know what they're doing. How many people do a lot of bad stuff, a lot of wrong stuff? They, they, they sin, but they want to hide it. They want to sweep it under the rug. They want to go behind the... They, they want to shut their blinds. They, they, they think they're hiding from somebody. But I'll tell you something. God sees everything. So you think that you're hiding in the darkness and God is seeing everything. You think you're hiding in the darkness, but God knows your heart. And so you're not hiding anything. But if you want to hold on to that, if you want to hold on to this life, if you want to hold on to the world, if you want to hold on to sin, and, and part of the way we hide, and, and this is part of the darkness, because we've, we've taken another step in this country to where now we're sinning right out in the broad daylight and saying it's not sin. But isn't that just another form of darkness? To, to pull the wool over people's eyes and, and pretend that we don't know that it's sin and, and, and we tell people it's not sin so that everybody agrees. But isn't that just another form of darkness trying to hide what we know is ungodly? Living in the darkness. Because men love the darkness more than they love the light. I don't know about you, but that's truly, that, that really, if you think about that, that deserves condemnation, doesn't it? Let me ask you a question. Anybody like Satan? Anybody a fan? You want to raise your hands? Anybody like him? Anybody, anybody think it's not fair that he's going to end up in hell one day? Or we all pretty much agreed that he ought to go there. Why is he going to go there? Because he's bad? Because he's Satan? Because of the name? Because of the pitchfork? Because of the horns? Because of the pointy tail? all these foolish things that we've come to think about, why, why is he going to hell? Ultimately, go all the way back to being why? Because he rejected God and he loved the darkness more than he loved the light. And God had to put him out. Isn't that the same thing with humanity? And yet we're hard on Satan. Now, well, let's send him to hell. He deserves it. He's got it coming. And we want to look at humanity and say, but we're not like that. We're lying to ourselves, church. The world is lying to itself. We are, the world and humanity as a whole is exactly like Satan. Following Satan, doing Satan's things, following the darkness, loving the darkness more than the light. Everybody who doesn't know Jesus has the same fate and is living the same life as Satan against God so that's the condemnation we believe Satan should be condemned now we understand and know that men also should be condemned and so we know that we need Jesus to be lifted up more than ever before for everyone that doeth evil hateth the light neither cometh to the light lest his deeds should be reproved 
I think that, that in a way, one of the reasons why people don't want to accept Christ is because they're scared to death of their deeds being reproved. Have you ever seen a more prideful people than the ones we live around today? And, and in the church and out of the church, but even in the church, we don't like to have our deeds reproved. Don't tell me what I'm doing wrong. The world sure doesn't want their deeds reproved. Who are you to judge me? Who are you to tell me anything about myself? And it's got into us. Now, I'm not even going to talk about the world. We know they don't want their deeds reproved. Let me talk just a little bit about the church, though. Because if we know Christ, we should want to be reproved. What does this say? The Bible says that if we know Christ, if we're one of His, then we'll welcome the light on our lives. There's a lot of talk now about transparency in government, transparency in marriage, transparency. And, and there are two, two ways of thought on this, especially like in marriage. I've read some, some marriage counseling things, and you'll see that there are two Two ways of thinking about this marriage thing. There's one where in marriage you hide things from each other, and there's one where you tell each other everything. Which one do you think is of God? The one that's transparent. Because everything of God is transparent. So don't listen to the things of the world that says hide, 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 hide. Be ashamed, hide in the corner, hide in the darkness. Don't do what you want to, but don't tell anybody. Hide things from your spouse. Hide things from your kids. Hide things from your church. Hide things in your community. No, shine the light on me, Jesus. See me. Know who I am. It's not good unless you make it right. But I understand that, and I'm humble enough to repent and ask for that light to be shined in my life. Now listen, you can't say I'm a repentant Christian person and then say, don't shine the light on my life. And we've got a lot of folks that want to do that. We want to, we want to keep the light off of us. We want to block the light. But listen, the light is good for us, church. Christians, the light is good for us to know that Jesus knows what's in my heart, to know that God knows what's in my heart. Listen, to tell each other that there's something wrong with my heart and I need to get it right, help me, brother. Help me, sister. Help me with my life. Help me to be more like Jesus. Point it out to me if you see it. We've gotten so far away from how the Bible teaches us to act and to live and to do church and to be Christians. And it's hurting us. Are you afraid of the light? Because in verse 21, and we're going to come to a close right here. But he that doeth truth. Notice that truth is not just an accurate fact. That's not what we're talking about. Truth is so much bigger than that. Truth is Jesus. Jesus is truth. Everything that he says, everything that he does, everything he wants of us is true. There's no, there, there's no darkness in it. There's no... There's no deceit in it. You look around the world and look and see how many things of the world are just full of deceit. Trying to play on your mind. Trying to lead you astray. Trying to lead you to, to think things that aren't true. Well, listen, God will never do that. He is truth. And if we live in His truth and come to His light, live in His light, that the deeds, listen, that our deeds may be manifest that they're wrought in God. God will do work in your life if you let Him shine His light in your heart. He will do things for you. He will do things to you. He will transform you in ways that you can't even comprehend. The person that you thought you were, you thought you couldn't get away from, the things that you thought you could not accomplish, the things you thought you could not Put aside the things you thought you, the sins in your life you thought you could never get away from. The things that you hate about yourself but you don't want anybody to know about. The light of God 
shining in your life can rid you of those things. It can do more for you than a million baths washing you clean in the blood of Jesus. We've got to humble ourselves, open ourselves up to the light that He wants to shine in our lives, to do the things, to work a work in our lives that we can't do ourselves, a work that we're not able to do. That's why we feel so defeated so often. It's because we're trying to do something that only Jesus can do. Brothers and sisters, if you don't know Jesus today, if he's not lifted up in the highest place, I'll say it again, if he's not in the highest place in your heart and there is something else and only you know where Jesus is, but if he's not in the highest place in your heart, then you've got some work to do. You've got to get into the light. You've got to let Jesus do a work in you and put himself on that pedestal in the place in your life where he needs to be and it will change you when you're not looking to some idol for something only Jesus can do. Y'all stand. We'll have a hymn of invitation.